Hello, welcome to Cosmology Talks. I have with me today Graham White, who is currently a postdoc at Triumph in Vancouver, and before that did his PhD at Monash. He's uh, one of the people who's on the border of particle physics and cosmology, so this particular talk will be on how to constrain, um, well, dark vector bosons using, using cosmology. Uh, I'll let him go into more detail, but uh, that's the general gist. So, yeah, the first thing: what, what did you what did you do in the um, in the paper? What is it that so, uh, so these days, uh, 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 we looked at uh, uh, the sort of particles which could uh, appear in uh, light hidden sectors, and we did a, uh, a careful treatment of um, of um, what those uh, how those particles can affect. Um, uh, Hit, uh, big, uh, big Bang nuclear synthesis, as well as the cosmic microwave background. But, um, and so uh, trying to drive constraints, both model dependent and model independent constraints. Cool. Um, so I, I'll ask uh, eventually um, exactly why that is, is a super well motivated thing to do. But, but just before we get to that, for the people listening, what are the what are two simple things that you would like them to take away? If this is all they take away from this, this whole video, what, what is it that they should take away? Uh, so the co cosmology um, uh, can uh, um, can constrain uh, both current measurements and future measurements. A a, a remarkable amount of um, uh, of um, uh, parameter space for light mass par uh, particles. And the parameter space it uh, it uh, it constrains is uh, something which is hard to rival. Um, on Earth, it's uh, it's very complementary because it's the weak coupling re re uh, regime, a very very weak coupling regime, um, and so it's complementary to astrophysics and and uh, ground based experiments um, in that sense, um, in uh, reaching uh, different parts of the parameter space. So this is like something that that you just can't get by normal particle physics methods. So it's a way to to learn stuff about particle physics using cosmology that just you can't get that information anywhere else. Exactly, exactly. Uh, you get constraints from cosmology um, for particles um, uh, with, um, which uh, are coupled so weakly that their lifetime is between um, order of um, 10,000 seconds um, to um, uh, a trillion times the age of the universe. Cool. Ah, so um, the most interesting question next would be, why did you do this? I guess we didn't got into this slightly already, but yeah, what what was unsolved that you wanted to solve? Why was that unsolved? Why hadn't someone already done this? Why did you particularly want to solve it? What's the background to this to this new work? Okay, so a lot of attention has now been um, directed towards uh, light dark matter, and the reason for this is because uh, we have the direct detection constraints in dark matter uh, mostly constraining us above a few GeV. Uh, so if uh, direct constraints get more and more stringent, you have two options. Uh, one is that uh, particle dark matter could be uh, much heavier, or uh, which is harder to test. And the other option, which is, uh, uh, which is uh, the lower hanging fruit, is to look at lighter, uh, lighter dark matter. And Lighter dark matter, which is below a GeV, is exactly where cosmology becomes uh, the most interesting. But also uh, is where a lot of our tools uh, break down. Some tools for looking at cosmological constraints on uh, gravitinos and WIMPs uh, could use a lot of dramatic uh, simplifications because a lot of rates were in equilibrium, a lot of processes were in equilibrium, and you can just uh, have a very simple, uh, a very simple uh, for recipe where you have no matter what uh, model you have, all that matters is the total amount of energy you inject into the universe and its lifetime, and you can have like completely model independent constraints. For below a GV, a lot of processes start to get uh, become slower than Hubble, so that means you need a much more careful, uh, much more careful uh, uh, treatment of uh, of the energy you're injecting and when you're injecting it. Secondly, a lot of these uh, a lot of these uh, um, 
uh, uh, processes, they depend on, you need to generate um, uh, a spectrum for the, uh, for the energy which you inject. And a lot of the public available tools we have are, don't, don't do that for one thing, uh, you're injecting energy below the QCD scale. So things like Pythia and all these uh, programs which have been designed for the LHC just uh, aren't, gonna, aren't gonna be effective uh, uh, below a certain amount. So can I just get a few clarification questions? Um, you say below one GV, the, at some point, if the mass gets too low, you start to reach like a warm dark matter regime. Are you sort of talking about a mass range that is above warm dark matter, but below one GV? Or are these produced <laughs> non-thermally, so they can be yeah, really light, but it doesn't matter? Yeah, between an MEV and uh, a GV. So the reason for that is because when you get below an MEV, your BBN constraints become uh, almost trivial because you stop, uh, stop being able to break up deuterons and you also can't decay into electrons. Um, and so the, uh, the constraints become a lot less, a lot less interesting. So the, the region where, uh, the region where uh, cosmological constraints are particularly interesting are between an MEV and a GV. Okay, and, and I guess that this was the second question. All of this is very much explicitly in the context of kind of beyond standard model stuff because you were saying you know you, you get this um bbn problem of of not being able to i can't exactly remember exactly what you said but can't be able to do stuff to protons and things like that if it was just a below one mev completely uninteracting dark matter that, that's obviously not a problem right because it's just it's not going to influence those particles and when yes, you said it's Oh, sorry, just, yeah, when you said above one GeV has been ruled out, again, that's kind of like weakly interacting stuff. It's not, it's not that you can't have a 10 GeV cold dark matter particle that just doesn't interact at all. Yes, so the constraints you have will essentially be uh, constraints on how much you interact uh, with, the, uh, with the standard model. And that is equivalent to its lifetime of decay into, uh, uh, decay into standard model particles. Cool. Um, and and what, what would you think? I think you've made a really good argument for why particle physicists will care about this. Is there anything that like the cosmology community should care about other than maybe just that isn't it cool that cosmology can constrain all this cool particle physics stuff? <laughs> well, that, that is precisely, I think, uh, uh, the fact that cosmology, uh, cosmology has been so successful, uh, the standard cosmology, the land of CDM paradigm has been so successful is uh, motivation to use it to um, guide us in, uh, in uh, severely constraining uh, new particle physics. We know there is dark matter and, uh, uh, the, and we know that uh, the dark matter is looking increasingly squeezed at, uh, right where we expect it to be at the, uh, at the, um, at the WIMP uh, um, area. And so, because uh, uh, the area where people are looking next and building a lot of direct detection experiments, uh, which is uh, the sub-GV uh, region, uh, that's, uh, that's where already, or cosmology already has a lot to say. Okay, so awesome. So now talk us through what, what, exactly, what exactly you did. If you want to open some slides now, that'd be, that'd be cool. Okay, so uh, this has been kind of the... Uh, uh, the relationship between theorists and experimentalists uh, the, over the last um, uh, over the last uh, thirty or so years, uh, saying that well, if we just build a uh, if we just build uh, some experiment which can uh, probe just a little higher mass, and there'll be some delicious new physics. But of course, we know uh, because of uh, 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 in the case of dark sectors, we expect something which is uh, going to be fairly weakly modeled. So it could have escaped uh, detection, so it can actually be lighter. And in fact, uh, lighter, is, uh, lighter dark matter is where you avoid uh, direct detection constraints because of the, uh, uh, because you go below nuclear th uh, thresholds. Okay. So, is it and basically why, saying that it's too light to, to like, I don't know, yeah, too light to affect the nucleus in some way, that it just doesn't have enough energy? Is that the... Exactly, exactly. It has to be... Have, uh, has to be heavy enough to give a thump to the uh, nucleus, and uh, and yeah. So, uh, and this is uh, where cosmology already has a lot to say. Uh, if you have a look at the uh, constraints uh, on the uh, on the right hand plot, this is uh, constraints that people have done previously 
uh, for one particular dark vector model, that's the photon, which we'll update today. And uh, the uh, and if you have a look at the effective coupling to the standard model, your unearth experiments are uh, starting to conk out uh, pretty pretty quickly. Then you have supernova experiments, which can, uh, which can get a supernova observation, which can go a little bit lower. But then your uh, where your BBN and CMB. Uh, so those previous ones are the grey ones, right? I mean now the exactly, exactly. ones. Okay. And your BBN and your CMB are looking at ridiculously weakly coupled uh, uh, constraints. So if your coupling is produced even by um, um, effective operators uh, producing these couple, couplings at very, very, very high um, uh, scale, then you're still going to have uh, uh, potentially have some constraints. So uh, the way BBN works is uh, it ver works very successfully in the standard model. Uh, and so uh, what happens is uh, uh, the basic picture is as you uh, press play on the universe, eventually the universe cools to the point where inverse beta decays start to freeze out. And, uh, uh, and that happens when your, uh, when your temperature goes below the uh, mass difference between your proton and neutron. And, uh, and then you can start to form elements. However, you encountered this uh, deuterium bottleneck, which delays your production of elements for a while. And that's where uh, uh, deuterons are being broken up um, at the same rate they're being uh, produced. But eventually that bottleneck is broken and you quickly produce all your elements around about 100 uh, kV. And uh, most of it appears in hydrogen and helium-4. Yeah. And so this whole process takes um, only the band symmetry of the universe um, as an input. And we have Sorry, a- So what is it? What is BAU? Uh, the band symmetry of the universe. Band symmetry of the universe. Okay, cool. Yeah. yeah. And we have an independent measure of that from the uh, CMB. And, and uh, if you just plug that in, you uh, predict the uh, uh, correct abundances of all your light elements, elements very, very well. And so this uh, constrains uh, uh, energy ejections from new long-lived particles. Since uh, the standard model works really, really well from this, uh, if you have uh, some new physics, it better not be um, um, screwing up uh, this beautiful picture. Very, uh, very so you say it takes only the baryon asymmetry of the universe's input. So that's that's how many. That's this baryon to photon ratio, right? Is that right? Yeah. It's how many. Um, I guess in the past, how many baryons and anti baryons they were that collided with each other. And there's a tiny asymmetry, so you've got a few baryons left over, which means that most of it's gone into photons, and you've got a few baryons. Why is this, um, when you say it constrains new energy injection, surely another input must be like the temperature or black bodiness. Is, is that another thing that has to be, why does energy injection? Matter? It's true, you do have to have a, your plasma um, have be in equilibrium, um, um, or will be close to equilibrium. And of course, your temperature evolution, you don't want to change your temperature evolution at all. That will completely screw things up. Uh, so your temperature evolution is going to be very fixed unless you're uh, injecting massive amounts of energy. Okay, so, so the, the new long-lived particles that kind of decay at exactly when BBN is happening would, would mess that part of it up. Okay. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Cool. So uh, we look at uh, light, dark matter. And uh, the idea is you have some uh, initial injection of uh, photons, electrons, neurons, pions, or neutrinos. Your neutrinos decouple, so that ends up being wasted energy. So if you have a dark sector which, uh, which uh, decays only into neutrinos, then you're going to be pretty safe. Okay. However, your uh, muons and pions decay, uh, partly into electrons and photons. And these electrons and photons interact with the background, creating some electromagnetic cascade. And this cascade can break up your nuclei and uh, screw up your abundances. Mm -hmm. And um, the uh, set of uh, 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 processes you have to keep track of, uh, since this is going to be short, I'm going to go through all of them, but I will uh, 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 state that one thing which has been a little bit neglected, which is very, very important for light injections, is final state radiation, where your uh, uh, initial charge neutral uh, dark, uh, uh, dark sector particle will uh, uh, decay into uh, E plus E minus plus a photon. Okay. What? What? Oh, just, just go back. So, so that last one is final state radiation. New particle decaying into those guys. What is BG? What is gamma BG and NBG? And 
Uh, so BG is uh, from the background. So you have like an injected photon interacting, interacting with the background photon okay. or back, background nucle nuclear. Okay. So these, uh, yes, yeah, so you have some, uh, some injected photons or electrons interacting with the background. Okay. Uh, okay. So, so the non-BG parts are the stuff that would come from this new decay channel from some new particle uh, that then, yeah, okay, that then interact in the background. And then there's also this final one where it's literally just the new particle decaying straight into positron electron and, and gamma. Okay, cool. Exactly, exactly. Okay, so then uh, the conventional wisdom is that your, um, is that you can, uh, uh, no matter what you inject, no matter what model you have, you end up, uh, 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 that ends up getting reprocessed into the same spectrum, no matter what you inject. Uh, you get thermally processed by background uh, uh, particles, and then you get uh, what's known as the universal spectrum. However, in our case, uh, the, uh, the universal spectrum will break down uh, for, for a couple of reasons. Uh, first, your uh, injected energy might be below, um, say, the, uh, the threshold energy for, um, for pair creation. Um, and you also might uh, drop it uh, below certain nuclear thresholds. So, uh, so for these line injections, if you compare what you get from nuclear, uh, for the universal spectrum uh, compared with uh, what, uh, what we find when we uh, calculate things uh, properly, then you're getting orders of magnitude difference. So uh, we were not the first to find, uh, point this out. Bullen and Serpico uh, showed this. So on the left and on the right, we have monochromatic injections of uh, uh, 30 MeV. Uh, one is a monochromatic uh, photon injection and the other is a monochromatic electron injection. So monochromatic means basically everything decays into photons and those photons all have exactly the same frequency? Uh, exactly the same energy. Okay. Yeah, yeah, same thing. Yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> sorry. Um, she can wave to the camera if she wants. <laughs> yeah. So um, yeah. So uh, and the uh, coloured curves are uh, so these are all different temperatures, and the coloured uh, curves are the um, exact calculation, and the uh, black curves are the universal spectrum. So you see, there's orders of magnitude gap between mm -hmm. uh, what you have, and so the dotted lines are without uh, FSR on the right-hand side, whereas the uh, full uh, full lines uh, include FSR. So you can see there's uh, uh, also a dramatic difference uh, in these low uh, uh, injections if you ignore the final state radiation. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so then uh, in terms of our observables, which we try and constrain, you have the, uh, you have the helium mass fraction, which is given in this strange notation here. Uh, the uh, deuteron ratio and the uh, helium uh, three abundance. Uh, yeah, do you want to quickly to maybe just unpack what YP is? Or if, if that's possible in, in a short number of words? Uh, it's the uh, fraction of the uh, baryons which end up in helium. Okay. So like, it's like 25% roughly. 25% okay. of your baryons end up in helium. Okay. I have no idea why they chose YP. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, and the uh, errors here uh, come from, uh, um, uh, two of them come from astrophysical. Uh, one's emission lines, some, um, uh, metal pore elect extra galactic region. The second one's a theory uncertainty. And the third one is observation of uh, uh, solar winds. Okay. So, so, so that, that, that constraint on YP is that's from nuclear synthesis rather than the CMB or? Uh, so the constraint on YP is, uh, is a uh, observational constraint. So oh, like direct constraint of like counting the number of heliums versus the number of hydrogens. In the universe. Yeah, exactly. I see. I see. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Uh, okay. So then, um, what we do is because we're interested in late injections, uh, since we're injecting quite uh, uh, quite light species, uh, we take the output of EDN from the standard model as our initial conditions, and then we see what we break up. Uh, and for it, for each case, there's going to be a source term and a uh, sink term, and both of these are going to depend on these uh, cross sections. For the, which will have the uh, which will involve these uh, nuclear processes for breaking up or creating nuclei, and these uh, cross sections have threshold energies below which, uh, if you're below which, you cannot um, uh, break up or create a nu nuclei. So this uh, spectrum here, this M sub gamma, if it doesn't have any support above that threshold energy, then you cannot uh, have any constraints because you cannot have this process. Okay. So then your, um, 
your threshold energies which matter are your first deuteron destruction, your first deuteron creation, and your first helium uh, destruction. And around these, you're gonna have qualitative uh, differences in your constraints. Below your first deuteron destruction at 2.2 MeV, you're not gonna have any constraints at all. Uh, you're gonna have a very mild uh, constraint when you can start to create deuteron, where you might be get uh, due to an overabundance rather than underabundance, or you might delay the. Uh, oh wait, so, so if you if you have an energy above two point two MeV but below five point five, there aren't many constraints, or there are where you're destroying due to run? Yeah, yeah, there still are from destroying due to run. Okay, um, but between five point five and twenty MeV, then the yeah. constraints can slow down a bit. Uh, in, 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 and then above. Uh, oh, I see. Is that because you're kind of destroying as much as you're creating? Yeah, yeah, you're compensating slightly. Yeah, yeah, okay. And so uh, we can see some of these uh, thresholds here. Uh, if we uh, inject uh, um, a photon injection below 10 MeV, uh, uh, at 10 MeV, monochromatic injection, then uh, there's only constraints from deuteron uh, depletion. Okay. And the y-axis here is uh, the energy times the, the yield, which is roughly the, which is proportional to the total energy density of your hidden sector. Okay, so it's like energy per interaction and then yield is number of interactions or something? Uh, so yield is uh, basically your number density, uh, your number density divided by the entropy density. Okay. So it remains fixed with the expansion of the universe. I see, okay. So your abundance, uh, yeah, your abundance is proportional to the energy times the yield. And your x-axis is just your lifetime in seconds. So uh, once you have uh, uh, the the middle uh, in the middle plot an injection above the uh, uh, stage where you can break up helium, you end up getting too much helium three. So even though the errors uncertainties on helium three abundance are absolutely massive, uh, they actually end up uh, being your strictest constraint. I see. Okay. So. Uh, in, in pr improving the uh, uh, the upper bound on helium three uh, from in astrophysics would cause a massive difference mm. in uh, the uh, eff effectiveness of these constraints. Where, uh, where are the limiting factors in making that constraint? How does um, it's um, yeah I'm not, I'm not so yeah so at the moment. Uh, the uh, there's a few attempts to find it. They all have pretty large error bars. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not 100 percent sure, other than a very vague comment that people find uh, seem to find this difficult. Okay. Uh, yeah. I mean, one plus or minus five is not is not great. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah Sorry, one so, plus or minus point five, but yeah, yeah, it's still not great. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And it, even with that huge uncertainty, they you end up getting the, the strictest constraints from this. So if this were right. certainly uh, increased by an order of magnitude in these, uh, that's an order of magnitude improvement in these constraints. Mm -hmm. So in the third one, uh, you have, uh, uh, eventually you have deuteron um, uh, overabundance uh, dominating uh, mm -hmm. at 100 And that's mostly because deuteron uh, uh, constraints are much uh, more, more uncertain. So for electron injection, uh, uh, Sorry, you have- Sorry, deuteron constraints are much more certain, you mean? Uh, yeah, exactly. Oh, okay. So the error bars are error bars are much uh, yeah. smaller. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they're like order ten to minus five. So mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. So and order ten minus seven. So uh, for electron injection, uh, you have a similar story of the same thresholds uh, uh, coming to view and same uh, dominance of helium three uh, in intermediate energies. Um, uh, have a one have a one thing to point out is uh, these are. Uh, uh, very, very, very uh, orders of magnitude different uh, oh, these okay. constraints. Yeah. So, uh, so we definitely do not have um, universal constraints. So, uh, in the universal spectrum, you wouldn't care uh, whether you uh, initially injected photons or electrons. Here, we see there's order mag orders of magnitude difference. Mm, I see. Yeah. And uh, and and thirdly, if we ignored FSR. Then, uh, then we get orders of magnitude difference as well. This would be, this uh, plot is here the same uh, uh, electron injections are ignoring far on site radiation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So putting it on a uh, on a contour plot, this is uh, uh, the energy of your uh, injected uh, species. Uh, so it's essentially uh, 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 half your mass of your injected species on the y-axis, and then your z-axis is your energy times your yield. 
And you see above this, if you're above both this white and uh, black line, you get something which looks like uh, the two graphs start to look the same. So in other words, uh, the injection is universal. You don't care whether you inject electrons or photons yeah, uh, or any combination in between. And, uh, and uh, what these lines are is one of these lines is where your inverse uh, Compton uh, photons uh, can't break up deuteron, that's your white line. And then your black line is when your uh, inverse Compton uh, drops below pair creation okay. uh, threshold. So these, uh, so if you have a look at where these uh, lines go up to, you're getting uh, the universal spectrum uh, breakdown all the way up to tens of GeV. So, uh, so even for moderately light uh, WIMPs, uh, you should be careful. And do you, do you not have any difference above that, essentially because you can't create electrons or create photons, and so then that's, that's also, sort of the same. You just inject energy, but you don't make new standard model. Yes, yeah, so above, above these thresholds, uh, yeah, once you inject the energy, it just gets quickly reprocessed yeah. uh, and goes into the equilibrium. Uh, very, yeah. So it quickly goes into this universal spectrum. So no matter what you inject, it gets reprocessed into this universal spectrum. It's mm -hmm. like an overall injection. Um, okay, so then, um, and then to do, uh, make this model independent, we say, well, any um, species which is uh, decaying at, at, at this energy is decaying into. Uh, uh, has to de decay into standard model particles, has to decay into muons or pions um, or electrons and photons. There's not much else um, at this energy. There's nothing else at these energies. Mm -hmm. And so then you, you're going to form a total spectrum. Uh, what, uh, part of your spectrum is from your direct uh, injections into electrons and photons. Then you have radiative uh, correct, uh, corrections. So like this is from your pions or your muons decaying. And then, then you're going to have your final state radiation. Okay. And so your total spectrum is a sum of all these pieces. Okay. Spectrum meaning like just literally the energy density, like the intensity is a function of energy density, essentially, or? Uh, so the spectrum is the amount of, uh, uh, yeah, the amount of uh, photons you have in each energy bin or the amount of yeah. electrons you have. So, so number of photons or, or intensity or, yeah, yeah. okay, cool, yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Okay, skipping to CM, uh, skipping, uh, skipping to the model independent constraints. Yeah. Uh, the um, uh, same plots as before. Here you have a threshold where you cannot uh, get constraints if you, uh, from uh, decays into these species if you're decaying above uh, uh, the mass uh, needed to produce these species. And uh, the differences in these uh, constraints are uh, uh, roughly due to uh, how much you're decaying into neutrinos. The more de uh, neutrinos you decay into, uh, the weaker the constraints are going to be. Okay. So pi naught does not decay at all into neutrinos, it goes into gamma gamma, and of course pi naught gamma is going to have the strongest constraints. Uh, pi plus, uh, your charge points decay quite a bit into neutrinos as do your muons. So, um, okay, so then we can get some model dependent constraints now that we have model independent constraints. Just basically by um, getting, uh, taking the branching ratios of uh, any uh, uh, any d dark vector or any um, species we have, and we can, branching uh, ratio just sort of it's it's a set of numbers that add up to one, which talks about like what proportion of the dark vectors will decay into yeah, yeah. Mu plus e minus what proportion into mu plus mu minus etc cetera, etc. Cetera. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. yeah. Exactly. So um, uh, so here's a couple examples for the dark proton the uh, b minus l. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and all you do is you uh, take the constraints uh, 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 the, uh, times uh, on each one of these uh, times uh, the branching ratio. So you just kind of like contract the two. Mm -hmm. And so what that looks like- There seems like, to be an interesting feature in, in that plot in the branching ratio is that like at exactly sort of 0.8 GeV, you- Yeah, so that's where you get some, uh, that's where you get some uh, resonant uh, production because you have some, uh, uh, yet yeah, uh, you start to mix uh, with your vector mesons okay. uh, in the standard model. Uh, because they're vector particles, you can mix with uh, vector mesons, so you get these resonant production. Cool, okay. And you can see those, uh, 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 those same features appearing at about 0.8 MeV here on both of these plots. It was a more gentle resonance for the dark photon uh, than it was. So this is, for, this is for like a specific model, this U minus, U1 of B minus L. So, so you've You've created a gauge boson using that B minus L baryon minus lepton number symmetry. Is that right? Exactly. Exactly. Okay. 
Okay. Yeah. And, and, uh, and yeah, so you see the, uh, the constraints are generally a little bit weaker than you, you get from just straight injection through electrons or photons because you're losing some of some uh, uh, to neutrinos. Um, and you're, you're also getting uh, this, uh, this interesting resonance feature you pointed out before around 800 MeV. Uh, then for your lepton family um, uh, um, uh, gauge, so you, this is where you gauge mu minus E, tau minus E, or mu minus tau. Uh, there's not much uh, uh, decays into hadrons, so the, uh, uh, so the constraints uh, do not have this uh, resonant feature, but they're roughly so, similar. So now form. we've got three other vector bosons that are three different symmetries, is that right? Exactly, exactly. Okay. Cool. And these symmetries are, like from the particle physics perspective, they're totally like robust and well-motivated. That It's possible that, that there is a vector boson associated with these and it's exciting yeah. to look for them and see what, what, whether we can find them or not. Yeah, so for, for, first of all, they're not ruled out. Second of all, they, appear, they can appear a lot in some uh, um, extensions to the same model. And third, they uh, can make new treatments uh, self-interact, which can be very useful for uh, solving the H0 problem. Uh, oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> uh, well, alleviated patient, not problem, I should say. So the uh, okay. So then you're uh, moving on to C and B constraints. Uh, C and B constraints are complementary. So just just to, to sort of conclude that that part at this stage, it's just constraints, right? Like that's it's ruling out certain um, strengths of coupling and certain lifetimes of these vector bosons there's no like i don't know like bump somewhere that's indicating that maybe the effects that these are having is showing up or anything like that anything there's, the, there's the the so-called lithium problem so okay. if i go right back um right back to the beginning yeah uh, so you see lithium here is uh uh not concordant uh all the others are concordant lithium is the bottom one yeah yeah can you sort of unpack why that's a problem? Like just, it's not, I don't think it's immediately obvious if you've never seen this plot before. Okay, so, uh, so this yellow bar should um, overlap with this um, um, purple band. Yeah, so what is the difference between the yellow and the, uh, and the purple? Okay, the yellow is what we observed and the purple is um, what we uh, predict. So the yellow is uh, what we observed to two sigma. And the purple is what we predict taking the baryon uh, to photon ratio that we see measured from the C and B. I see. And the green curve is, is what? Uh, so, the, uh, so the green curve is, uh, is uh, how the uh, abundance uh, uh, changes uh, as a function of the baryon to photon ratio. I see. Okay. And how the prediction would change. Okay, okay, I think I get that, or at least I can unpack it in my, in my own time. Cool, uh, so yeah, so, that, so that's the conclusion of the, oh, and, and does the lithium problem, are, are any of the, the sort of data constraints you've been looking at showing that these dark vectors might have an impact on the lithium problem? Uh, that's a follow-up paper. Uh, All right, keep, stay tuned. <laughs> so yeah, you have to wait for the next paper in the series. Okay, okay. <laughs> Yeah, are you willing to, to uh, give a hint? <laughs> it's okay if you <laughs> uh, We're not sure. Uh, yeah, so you have to wait. <laughs> Fair enough. But the fact that there is a paper shows that there must be some impact on it. And you're just not sure yeah, how yeah. big or how small or anything. Okay. Exactly, exactly. Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay, so then... Um, I think uh, this has so been about half an hour. To... So if we can do the CMB like slightly quicker, that, that would be good. Um, okay. Okay, so I'll try and spend 10 minutes on this. Okay. So, um, so if you have a look at where these uh, uh, lifetime uh, constraints uh, are strongest, they start to conk out around about um, uh, 10 to 13 uh, seconds, and they're strongest around about 10 to the 8 seconds. And this is where CMB is very complementary. Uh, CMB uh, constraints on the ionization uh, fraction, uh, uh, ionization history of the universe, uh, uh, these are constraints between 10 to the 12 seconds and 10 to the uh, 25 seconds. So they're pretty much uh, very uh, directly complementary to BBN constraints. 
so uh, the idea is uh, that uh, if you uh, inject energy uh, 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 during time, uh, during during our uh, recombination, uh, what you can do is you can uh, re uh, reionize uh, some uh, uh, some uh, hydrogen and helium. Um, so the way this works is if you inject energy during recombination or after recombination, you can uh, keep some uh, particles ionized uh, during the cosmic dark ages, uh, uh, which will broaden the uh, surface of light scattering. And that also will uh, uh, enhance uh, polarization uh, in the uh, CMB as well. So we can get pretty strong uh, constraints on that since the CMB is so well. So again, when, uh, if you inject uh, en uh, energy at, uh, at, at a given time, uh, not all of it is uh, uh, deposited into, into the intergalactic me medium, uh, but you have to, uh, again, uh, process it uh, through the series of uh, thermal uh, 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 transfer functions. And you only care about uh, what energy is deposited into um, ionizing uh, the medium. You don't really care about, for example, what heats things up or what uh, produces low energy photons. And, is this, uh, is this uh, so long as it, because if you change the black body spectrum, that's, that's a big deal, right? But this is, is this, is this like weaker energy input that is not going to change the black body spectrum too much, but might, I might just change this ionization fraction. Is that what's happening here? Or? So, so so the third thing we'll look at is changes to the black um, body okay. spectrum, uh, but that's a um, or that tends to constrain things in a different part of parameter space. I see. Okay. Okay. That's like slightly shorter lifetimes, mm -hmm. basically. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so uh, yes. Yeah, so the uh, so eventually uh, uh, there's a publicly available code uh, which is the nicely done by Tracy Slater, uh, where you can uh, take a particular. Uh, uh, ionization efficiency uh, and uh, use and amount total en uh, energy injected and use that to uh, uh, to work out exactly uh, how much effect you have on CB and whether that's acceptable or not. And the result uh, the result is uh, if you have a look at the energy times yield, the constraints are roughly six times uh, uh, stricter than the constraints on uh, from BBN. But the lifetime uh, lifetimes you're looking at are uh, very, very different. You're looking mm -hmm. at uh, 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 constraints basically becoming negligible around about 10 to 12 seconds and, uh, and being their strongest around about 10 to the 14 seconds. The reason why they become uh, weaker before 10 to the 13 seconds is uh, before then, then your particles are uh, decaying before recombination and you're not injecting as much uh, energy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Again, you see this uh, feature with the uh, resonance around about 0.8 uh, mm -hmm. 0.8 GeV, which you don't see in the uh, lepton family uh, uh, cases. Okay. So, uh, as you mentioned before, uh, you have uh, the third constraint you can have uh, from cosmology is departures from a black body spectrum, yeah. and uh, and this is if you have the case um, between the decoupling of double Compton and Compton scattering, which is well before recombination, and the case uh, after decoupling com com uh, Compton scattering and recombination. Mm -hmm. So you're going to constrain a different uh, lifetime to uh, mm -hmm. changing the ionization history. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and so the, uh, uh, the uh, constraints end up being on this uh, Y parameter, which is, uh, which is a, a measure for how much you're changing the shape of your black body spectrum and the chemical potential, which is basically how much you're lifting the black body spe uh, spectrum. And uh, the, uh, there's one current past experiment called COBE, which uh, puts uh, uh, existing constraints on the uh, photochemical potential in this wide parameter. And it's a projected uh, 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 satellite called the Pixie satellite, which could come online any year. And that's, uh, and that's uh, uh, several orders of magnitude better uh, in terms of its constraints. And so we can put all this together, uh, this is the last thing, we pull this together by uh, saying that a, uh, a minimum uh, abundance we can have, uh, it, uh, we can produce is the freezing abundance. 
So you can produce much more uh, abundance of any of these uh, uh, hidden sector particles if you reheat into them. But if you don't reheat into them at all, uh, then the minimum you can produce is uh, the freezing abundance. Can you, can you if, explain what a freezing abundance is? So that's the abundance you get from just weakly coupling to the standard model. So the fact that you have any couplings to the standard model uh, will mean that you, uh, even though there's, uh, that interaction is slower than Hubble, you're still going to leak in some energy. I see. Into I see. Okay. Okay. So, so it'll be some tiny subfraction of the total energy density because the decay rate is so slow, but that doesn't mean that it's not zero. So some stuff comes into existence. I see. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And it's to, so to compare where, the freeze out, which is where they stop being produced, but we're yeah. being produced abundantly. Freeze in is kind of the, it's it's yeah. that it's that continuing tiny amount that is all there is. So, yeah, exactly, exactly. Okay. So, often you can easily imagine cosmology where you produce much more than this. But if we want uh, particle physics constraints rather than just cosmo constraints, which we have here, mm -hmm. these are essentially cosmo constraints. Uh, then we want to know what's the minimum we're going to produce. Yeah. Okay. And, and uh, this is all under the assumption that the dominant decay modes are into standard model rather than to some light dark sector sure. uh, particle. So, um, yeah, so uh, one uh, point to make is uh, we found that, uh, that, your, uh, that your constraints on your dark photon were the strongest uh, because uh, uh, they had the least amount of junk going into neutrinos. However, neutrinos, uh, coupling to neutrinos means that you also produce more uh, of a particular particle. So that, uh, so that ends up meaning, uh, because you have inverse decays from neutrinos, so that ends up meaning that your, uh, these two uh, factors can kind of compete with each other. And so uh, some, particle, some particle which you might think is less constrained because it's dumping a lot into neutrinos might not end up being just as constrained because you're producing more of it in the end. Okay, and the, the y-axis so on those plots was like a, a normalized cross-section parameter? Uh, so the y-axis here is uh, the yield you produce uh, for the same coupling. Um, oh, okay. So not, not yet a constraint on the mass, but like a, a, a theoretical plot showing the, yeah, the, yeah. the yield. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And so here is um, the actual constraints uh, from all your different uh, um, uh, uh, cosmological observables. So we, to compare like with like, we had a look at the same effective couplings. So we had to put in some four pies to compare the photo, dark photon with the the other uh, particles. Uh, so eventually, so essentially you have the green being your BBN constraints, mm -hmm. your uh, uh, shaded red being your current constraints from uh, uh, ionization, and your, uh, your dashed red being the best you can produce. Uh, you might look at these jags here, that's not mathematical weirdness, that's actually your hadronic resonance, it's because you see they're around about 800 MeV. Mm -hmm. And Jags then these of the uh, B minus L on the sort of far right of the red thing, you mean? Yeah, exactly, exactly. Okay. I'm getting used to not having a pointer. I think, I think <laughs> if you pointer. use your cursor, people can see it, but I, I probably should have told you that half an hour ago. Okay. <laughs> so, um, so the uh, yellow here is the uh, uh, departures from black body with uh, the uh, shaded yellow uh, Kobe experiment, which only has a constraint on dark photon, but this um, uh, much much larger constraint is. Uh, from Pixie. Uh, so we see here that we go all the way up to 10 to minus 12, which is roughly close to where astrophysical constraints uh, start to mm -hmm. kick in. Mm -hmm. And we can get pretty much the entire parameter space. And below here, you're really starting to get into swampland territory, where swampland oh, uh, regravity conjectures are starting to become relevant. Okay. Uh, so we're, we're, uh, this is actually uh, is Absolutely a astonishing reach that cosmology can give us. Um, yeah, just to, this, to can I uh, ask a clarification question. So that, let's just look at the red one, for example. The, the red one doesn't constrain a coupling that's, that's stronger than 10 to the minus 15. Can you just sort of explain why, why it can constrain a weak coupling but not a stronger coupling? I, I, I'm having some sort of a confusion there. Okay, so if you, get a, uh, if you get a coupling which is too weak, then the lifetime's too long. And as the lifetime gets longer, then uh, then your um, uh, then your uh, C and B constraints get weaker. But also, as your coupling gets weaker, you produce less uh, less of it. Uh, for the coupling getting too strong, then you decay before recombination. Yeah. Uh, 
uh, even though you're pretty small. Yeah, I'd missed the link between uh, decay time. But yeah, so if it, if it decays too early, then then it can't constrain. I've got, it. and that's obviously why the nucleosynthesis ones are higher because it happens earlier. Yeah, yeah exactly, exactly. Cool. Cool. Yes, so this is a pretty astonishing uh, reach. They can hmm. almost wipe out the whole thing if we launch the uh, Pixies. And it's also nice that it's, it's happening for all the four different types of vector bosons. So it's not like it's not like some highly contrived model that you can constrain. But okay, most models wouldn't be constrained at all. It is quite generic. It looks. Yeah, so you'd have to contrive a model uh, to avoid this. Uh, one way you could do that is you could have like another particle in your light sector, which your uh, dark for the case too or something like that. Particle physicists always have an answer. <laughs> yeah, there's always a way out. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. Okay, cool. Cool. So yeah, in conclusion, uh, uh, we're getting motivation to look. We know dark matter exists. Uh, we know that particles exist at, uh, at, at the MEV scale. So uh, uh, that's uh, uh, some hint, maybe that's where uh, where our dark sector particle uh, could exist. And this is where constraints are quite weak, but where cons cosmological constraints become the most interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, and we've uh, uh, had a look at uh, doing this more carefully in a uh, model independent and model dependent way. Cool. Thank you. Um, so one of the next questions is where to next, which I guess kind of came up that you're already looking into the lithium problem. What, what else are you, uh, are you doing next with this sort of theme of research? Yeah, so the lithium problem is um, is one way, uh, uh, one thing I'm looking at. Uh, the next thing to look at is just um, just more models. So one thing particularly looking interested in is glue balls, uh, and uh, because uh, uh, there's been a lot of interested interest in uh, in uh, hidden sector, uh, hidden uh, confined sectors, uh, due to the scent miracle, uh, for example. And, uh, Can you and, super briefly say what the Simp miracle is? I haven't actually heard of it before. Obviously, I mean, well, obviously, I have heard of the Wimp miracle, but yeah, no Simp miracle. Yeah, so this is the Simp miracle is where you have a strongly interacting uh, dark sector where you have some cannibalization going on, okay. and you find out that um, uh, Can cannibalization yeah. is. A cannibalization is where you have uh, the abundance is set by three, three to two processes. Uh, so that's where three particles, uh, uh, so three uh, dark sector pions or dark sector glue balls uh, as well can do this. Uh, we'll um, uh, annihilate into two. Okay. So you have a three to two. Okay. 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 So, so yeah. And so now the, the simple miracle is where cannibalization carry on. Yeah. So, okay. So you, uh, you miraculously find that when you imp impose all your constraints and what you need, uh, you end up uh, getting uh, the right dark matter abundance. Okay. Interesting. Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah, so, so, that, so you were saying that the, that, that motivates looking at, yeah, dark blue balls or something. Yeah, some, uh, some uh, products of uh, various confined uh, dark sector products. Okay. Um, yeah, and then, uh, yeah, there's, there's a few, uh, yeah, so yeah, the next step is obviously looking at different uh, new models uh, and another, uh, another thing uh, to look at is, of course, um, motivating uh, new ways of uh, new cosmologically consistent ways of creating light dark matter as well. So, so at the moment, the uh, the model space is uh, very very small. That's another thing I'm worried. I guess the other thing um, is for observers to hurry up and launch Pixie because it looks like um, that's like the on the observational side the. Because the, the red lines aren't going to change very much, but the yellow lines are going to. I mean, for the B minus L. I mean, only for the dark photon, are there already, um, it looks like spectral distortions constraints, right? Like, Yeah, exactly. So uh, these are, are quite miraculous. They're better than, if you think of what it'd take to get a, to improve Planck to its cosmic variance limit in terms of money compared to how much it would cost to uh, launch Pixie. It's crazy <laughs> that the Kobe satellite is still from the 90s the best, the best constraint on this. It is, it is. It is, and and we've shown like pretty much all the dark vectors, but you can show like dark scalars or dark um, fermions as well. Uh, and yeah, Pixie is going to be probably the most interesting. Awesome. So, um, do you want to just quickly repeat what you said at the beginning, which is the, the the two simple things you want people to take away from the paper and the video? I'll link to the paper in the description. Okay. So the uh, two things 
to take away are uh, uh, that we're motivated to look for uh, light, light, dark matter, and light, dark matter is precisely where cosmology gets uh, becomes the most constraining and most interesting. However, this is precisely where uh, new tools need, need to be built to uh, analyze things properly because uh, things become a bit more subtle in this region. Cool. Um, and one final question that I've asked everyone so far, outside of your own research, what do you think is the most interesting thing or things in cosmology at the moment? Okay, so, uh, well, I'm cheating a little bit because uh, I'm talking about stuff which is, which I do research, uh, but that's because I'm, uh, but I, I think there's three things which I find the most uh, interesting in the moment. One is gravitational wave physics, because it's the only thing uh, where, which can probe pre uh, Big Bang nuclear synthesis. So it's going to, if we observe some uh, primordial gravitational waves, they're the only thing which proves that the universe is older than BBN, rather than just miraculously started just BBN. Uh, and it's, it can put bounds and reheating temperature, tell us all sorts of amazing new physics. It can probe scales, which are really, really high. Uh, second thing is uh, electric biogenesis. Uh, pretty much every experiment pr proposed over the next two decades is in some ways going to probe uh, the paradigm of electric biogenesis. And when you say every the, experiment, you mean like particle physics experiment or...? Yeah, gravitational waves uh, proposes, uh, will probe it, uh, as well as uh, new colliders will probe it, because there will be Higgs factories and we'll be precision Higgs. Um, electric dipole moments will probe it. So there's quite a concordance, and this is the big paradigm which we're really testing. I see. So you really mean every experiment? Like a, okay. Yeah. Yeah, it's, and it's, it's still a, one of the old unsolved ones. Like everyone's working on dark matter and dark energy nowadays, but the baryon asymmetry has, has been around for longer and well, maybe not longer than that matter, but yeah, and still not completely solved. Yeah, that's interesting. And, and do you have others that you wanted to, to say? Yeah, so, so I guess, and the third thing I find interesting is just light dark matter because uh, the uh, cosmology of light dark matter is so interesting and the particle physics of light dark matter is interesting. It's quite a challenge uh, producing it. Uh, uh, in new exciting ways as well as uh, testing some models and it's a lot more exciting I find them a lot more exciting than WIPs. Cool. Uh, that's my that's my <laughs> well thanks for um thanks for uh, giving the talk uh, people don't know that you volunteered for this on quite late notice so I'm, I'm very very thankful uh, and to anyone who's who's made it through this far in any of the talks don't forget to to like and subscribe but more importantly share it with your colleagues because I don't think the YouTube algorithm is ever going to suggest them um, talks as technical as this, but thank you, Graham, and thank you, everyone who's listened this far. Thank you.